Um, so, thank you. Um, we are going to continue on uh, with our time together, and we're going to begin a new series today, uh, looking at the promise of Christmas. Now, often when we approach the Christmas season, you know, uh, pastors will choose passages like Luke chapter 2, um, or they will look at Isaiah chapter 9, and, and those passages I hope to look at in the coming weeks. However, um, something we often miss out on is the truth that Christmas has been God's plan all along. It has been His plan all along, and we will see that even in the Old Testament. And as we're going to see today, even at the very beginning, God's plan to save His people and send Jesus Christ. And so uh, today and over the next couple of weeks, we are going to be look at, looking at Christmas from the Old Testament. We've been looking at the book of Joshua in the Old Testament and seeing there how it points to Christ, how God's promises will not fail. And today and through the, the month of December, we're going to see how God's promises point to Christ all throughout the Old Testament. We're going to look at some specific passages that point us to the coming of Christ. And we're going to celebrate Christmas as being God's plan, God's promise kept and fulfilled in Christ. So I would ask, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. Many of you already know what Genesis 3 is all about, but I'm going to read the first 15 verses, and we're going to specifically camp out on one verse. However, uh, we've got to give some context to that verse. And so we're going to read verses 1 to 15 and look at what this has for us very quickly. I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible version, and the, it will be on the screen behind me. Uh, so you can follow along there, but if you have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 15. This is God's word for us this morning. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat of it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for attaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. And here's the verse I want us to look at today. 
I will put hostility or enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is God's word for us this morning. May he write its truth on our hearts. Let us pray once more. Oh God, we come to you acknowledging that we are weak, sinful, oftentimes confused people. And Lord, we approach, we approach the word of God, which is without error, which is inspired by you. And Lord, we, it is the revelation of who you are and we ask now that, God, you would give us insight into these words that we've just read. We ask that it would open our hearts to a God who is holy, who is just, who, does, who, who, who will bring judgment upon sin, but is, who is also gracious, who is loving, who is kind. A God who pours out his mercy on undeserving sinners. And so, Lord, we ask that you would lead us through this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Origins are important. Origin stories are very important because they provide an understanding of a character's nature. They give us insight as to who this person is, where they came from. I mean, we're familiar with this on the island, right? Probably one of the most common questions asked of someone when you meet them is, who's your father? Who's your father? Tell me who, you, who, who your father is. I want to know if I'm connected to him somehow. Or I want to know, oh, you're from the, that Gallant clan, right? That McDonald clan. I often get, you know, you're not from around here, are you, Dockstetter? Who's your dad? I don't know who that is. When it turns out, actually, my mother's side of the family is all Western part of PEI, but anyways, that's another story. Maybe that gives a little bit more of my origin story, and it provides understanding of my nature. And here, in this passage that we're looking at here today, we're going to see the beginning of the gospel Revealed in time. Revealed in time and space. Now, I, I would say that this has been God's plan all along, even from eternity. Our God is a timeless God, and he, he, there is no change in Him. He is immutable. That is, He does not change. And so, therefore, this has been God's plan all along to bring the good news into a broken world. Yet here we read in Genesis chapter 3 of the beginning of the gospel revealed in time. God's promise before Christ even arrives on the scene. Many, many, many pages later, many, many years later in the book of Matthew and in the New Testament... And yet, even here, in Genesis chapter 3, we see God with us, even when everything is falling apart. And especially when everything is falling apart. One of the most disastrous moments, if not the most disastrous moment in all of world history, when man and woman disobey God. And the relationship between God and them is severed, is distorted, is broken. And man is corrupted. And through Adam and Eve, our first parents, we all have sinned in Adam. Adam, a representative, a, our federal head. And thus, uh, us in him have sinned. Even there, when everything is falling apart, even when there's chaos, even then, God is with us. And if that's the truth then, it is the truth today. That even now, God is with us. Christmas is the season of peace, of hope, of love, of joy, and it is met with the reality of a battle. 
You didn't think coming to church today you'd hear about hear this. Christmas is a battle. Christmas is a battlefield. But it is in, re in reality because we see in it, we see in it hope, but we see it in the midst, in the backdrop of the curse of sin and evil as we sung about in Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And what I want us to see today is this. In the presence of a curse, God's promise stands victorious over all. Amen? In the presence of a curse, God's promise stands victorious over all. So, and over evil. So three things very quickly. We're going to see how the battle begins. In the midst of the completion of the Garden of Eden, think about it, there's just something that, that veils Genesis two, 1 and 2, right, for us? That we just can't fully grasp because we've not known a world without brokenness or sin. And so when we read Genesis 1 and 2, there's just something that we fail to grasp, but yet it describes something so perfect, so beautiful, that God himself creates this beautiful garden for all that he has made to flourish and to grow. And God looks at what he has made and says, it is good. And yet in the midst of that completion, in the midst of that garden, we read about an intruder, an intruder, in Genesis chapter 3. And he's known as the cunning serpent, or in some translations, the crafty serpent. And I don't think it's by accident that Moses, who wrote this book, who put this down on pages, Moses, who wrote this down on a scroll, I don't think it's by accident that he included that little adjective of the serpent. He was crafty, he was cunning. He's trying to get us to see something going on, and he's also trying to get us to, to pay attention to the words in which this serpent uses. We must examine his words carefully, because words have meaning. And the serpent here uses various tactics in his language to attack, essentially, God's language, God's word, what God has said. You'll see he uses an incomplete truth. Did God really say? He's casting doubt. Are you sure God really said this? God, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Well, again, he's twisting God's words because God said you can eat from every tree in the garden save one. Save one. And so the twisting of God's word is seen here. And it's also important for us to recognize how the serpent even refers to God. Because Genesis 1 and 2, and actually in the chapters and verses that follow, refer to God as the Lord God. That is, the covenant-keeping God. The God who has relationship with his creation and yet here the serpent refers to God simply as creator God. Just gives him that little bit of acknowledgement that, yeah, he created, but maybe he's not a covenant-keeping God. Casting doubt. Subtly. He's not revealing God as a covenant partner. He's trying to pit the woman and the man against God. And so we see here from the woman in her response in verse 2, in verse 2, we see her, by her response, there's slight alterations, slight changes that, that come from her, her response. We may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat of it or touch it. Here we see she's adding to what God has said. God did not say you must not touch it, but here she's adding, or you will die. And so here we've already seen where God's word is, is being used in a very fast and loose way, where specifics are taken from God's word and things are added to God's word. And I think that that's very important for us as Christians. As we handle scripture, we must recognize that we oftentimes sinful nature will try to add to God's word and take away from God's word. And eventually, things just begin in this watershed moment that 
The, there's slight alterations in the woman's response, casting doubt. There's a shift in her thinking. We read there that she looks at the tree and sees that it was good for food and delightful to look at, and it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. And soon there's this indulgence. She takes and eats. And men, just in case you're wondering, you're not let off the hook in this regard. It's often that we look at this passage and think, oh, that woman. Well, on the one hand, the woman was deceived, which is what Paul says later in the New Testament, because that's actually what happens. The woman herself attests to that. We read it already. She said, that serpent deceived me. I was tricked. I was deceived. But yet also, the man, we read, is right there with her. The man is right there with her. And he didn't think to say, uh, uh, Eve? Eve? Maybe, do you remember what God said? No, he just let this whole thing play out. And he himself gave himself in to the desires of his flesh. To be greater than God. To, to take someone else's word for it. And therefore, sin and everything falls apart. But the question is, who is this serpent? Who is this snake? Now, we actually don't find out till the very end of the Bible. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, that we read that that snake or that serpent is Satan, or the Satan, the adversary. We often use Satan as his name, but it's actually in the original, the Satan, which means the adversary. The one who comes against this dissatisfied rebel we can read about in Isaiah 14, who he himself wanted to be greater than God and fell from heaven, was cast from heaven, cast, sent away from the presence of God. He is this intruder. And by this act, this violation that man and woman have committed, they have now joined forces together with the serpent against God. They have now joined for forces with the serpent. They have taken not God's words, which Scripture says, God's word, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. They have now taken someone else's words and applied their lives to that. And as such, have disobeyed God have sinned against him, have severed the relationship between themselves and God, and here the battle begins. Because sin unites us to evil against God, creating corruption and chaos. Make no mistake about it. The condition of this world, the condition of this world is because of sin. Brothers and sisters, we must see this. It is because of sin. It has united us to evil against a holy, righteous, perfect God. So the battle begins. And the battle continues. The Lord is not absent in the garden. We read there of Him walking... When the man and wife, verse 8, hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. So the Lord called out to them and said, said to him, Where are you now? Again, does God not know where they are? <laughs> he is an all-knowing God. He knows exactly where they are. So why does he ask the question? Why does he even bother? Where are you when you, he knows all along where, he, where the man and the woman are? What he's doing is he's inviting confession. He's inviting confession, and instead of stepping forward, Adam and Eve stepping forward and saying, God, we've sinned. What do they do? They pass the blame. They sidestep. They hide. God invites them forward. It's like, you know, as parents, right? Our kids, we know, our kids know they've done something wrong, and so they run off and hide. And we know that they've done something wrong, and so we call them and we invite them. What happened? Even though you know as a parent, you know what happened. 
but you want to hear it from their mouths. What, what, did, what did you do that wasn't okay? And again, Adam and Eve, pass the blame. Adam, again, real stand-up guy here, <laughs> really showing that those words that he spoke over Eve, you know, she's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and singing this incredible romantic love song to his wife as God unites them in marriage, all of a sudden that falls apart, right? And Adam now is like, that woman that you gave me, so not only is he blaming Eve, he's blaming God for giving him this woman. I can guess that the brownie point system was not invented back then, but I would say that this put Adam in the very negative. He's passing the blame, and then Eve is like, no, it's that serpent. He deceived me. He deceived me. And here's where it gets interesting. The Lord looks to the serpent. Again, he's not letting Adam and Eve off the hook, but he looks to the serpent and he declares war. He declares war. Look at what he says. Because you've done this, you are cursed. Cursed are you. That word cursed there means to oppose, to come against, to defile, to... And what God is doing here is God is saying, I am against you. I am against the work that you have done here. You are cursed. I'm coming against you. I am opposing the work of the serpent. So God declares war. And then, interestingly enough, God divides. God divides. How does he divide? Look at verse 15a. I will put hostility between you and the woman. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, this is both a blessing and a curse. Just track with me for a moment here. God intervenes, draws lines between the woman and the snake. Remember, I had just said that in our sin, we have united ourselves to evil. We've united ourselves to the serpent. Here, God is saying, no, I'm going to draw a line between the work of the serpent and the work of the woman. I'm going to put hostility between them. I am going to put hostility between, between them. In this way, the Lord declares freedom. In this way, the Lord declares freedom. Freeing us from the forces of evil now means that we are in conflict with it and in conflict against it. So God declares freedom for the woman, and we'll get to more of that in just a minute, and he does so by declaring war against the serpent, the works of the serpent. And so then God, God declares war, God divides, and God develops. He develops this thought. He says, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He points to an ongoing conflict between the two. He uses this word offspring. It's the w literal word seed. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Now think about that for a moment. We've probably heard this verse over and over again. But think about that for a moment. What does it mean by serpent's seed? Serpent's offspring. Is he speaking of a literal offspring? That the serpent is going to have these maybe snake-like creatures, or maybe he's going to have special human beings come from him? Is that what God's speaking about? No, that's not what he's getting at here. We're not talking about a literal seed. Rather, what, we're, what God is implying here, what he's saying here, is that those who join in league with the serpent, those who unite themselves to him in, a, in, in declaring war against God... Those who are corrupted by sin are those who are of the serpent's seed. Those who are of the serpent's offspring. It's very interesting because he next goes, God next goes on to say, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her 
offspring, or literally seed. Again, you must ask the question, do, does a woman have a seed? No, that's often used in reference to a man, right? It's referenced, especially in Scripture, to man's seed. But why here? Does, do women literally have a, a, a seed in this way? And again, it's not a literal explanation. Rather, it's physically impossible for a woman to have a seed. But here, we hear of this woman's seed, this woman's offspring. And so if it's impossible for a woman to bear a child in and of herself, there must be something miraculous that must take place. There must be some kind of miraculous implantation into the woman that then would cause a different seed, a different offspring to come about. Do you know what I'm talking about here? There is coming, there is a woman who will miraculously bear an offspring, not by man, because Adam and his sons and all of the sons that would follow were disqualified. There must be a greater man that must come forward. A new Adam. Born of a woman. Who will declare war against the serpent. You see... Those who are of the woman's offspring in this regard is referencing Christ. Christ eternal. Christ is the seed of the woman. In Him, we become God's spiritual children. And this Christ is, this is Christ specifically because there in the very next line it says, He will strike your head, not her. He will strike your head. Unfortunately, there's a picture going around on social media these days that shows a picture of Eve and Mary. And, you know, it's this, supposed to be this wonderful work of art where, you know, Mary's pregnant and, you know, Eve is there comforting Mary and they're looking down at her belly. And then down at the bottom of the picture, you see the serpent under Mary's foot. Just as a side note, that's theologically incorrect because Mary is not the serpent crusher. It is her child who is the serpent crusher. It is Christ. It is Him. He is the one who will strike the head of, who, who, will, who will strike uh, the head of the serpent. And so the spiritual battle begins and the spiritual battle continues all throughout the book of Genesis and in the Old Testament and into the New Testament. Even in Ephesians 6, we read of the taking up the armor of God. There's a battle that continues to go on. There's a battle that we face today. And that battle is against sin, against the offspring of the serpent, that all who will unite with the serpent are his offspring. Jesus says this of the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. So the battle continues, but the gospel reunites us to God against evil. And praise God, it doesn't end there. We have hope. And this is why this is so important for the Christmas season. The battle is won. Praise God. It's not a never-ending battle. Because here, in this verse, verse 15, we get the first indication of the gospel. The first indication of a resolution. It's called the, in, in, um, <clears throat> it's called the proto-euangelion in the Greek, which means first gospel. First gospel proclaimed, where God speaks of a resolution that he's going to bring in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of all this mess, God is going to deliver. The last line here speaks of a specific offspring, as I said. It's a he, not a she. Where 
this offspring will bruise, will, he will have his heel bruised and will crush the head of the serpent. Now, there's a difference there. There's a difference there. And I think it says something to the glory of this seed who will come, of this man who will come. He will bruise the heel of this man because that's as far as the serpent can reach. And yet, this man will deliver a death-crushing blow to the serpent. It's interesting, isn't it, that as you read Genesis chapter 3, that God curses the serpent directly. He says, cursed are you, but not the man and the woman. And that's not saying that we're not affected by sin. Of course we are. But you'll notice how God says, cursed is the ground because of you. And explains to the woman the, the pains that she will deal with in, in childbearing as the result of the curse. But to the serpent, he says, cursed are you. See, God is specifically, specifically focusing in here on the works of evil, on the work of sin. And he's saying, no, I, I'm, I'm going to work this out. I'm going to save my people, those who will truly be mine, and they will be set apart to do battle against the serpent and in his work, and they will proclaim the good news. The good news of that snake crusher. The one who came and was victorious. Why is it that God curses the serpent directly and not the man and the woman? Well, it's because there will be one who will be cursed on our behalf. There will be one who will be cursed in our place. There will be a substitute who will be victorious. See, the Old Testament is the account of those two offspring, the two seeds in conflict. And the New Testament is the record of the birth of Christ and his victory over Satan through the cross. And the rest of the New Testament is living in light of this victory. And that's, that's for us as, as believers, that the battle is won. Brothers and sisters, Christmas is a declaration of hope. That though the battle continues, we know the battle has been won. The battle has been won. The gospel reveals Christ's victory over evil. Charles Spurgeon, and if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm a Spurgeon fan. Charles Spurgeon says this about this passage. This is the first gospel sermon that was ever delivered on the surface of the earth. It was a memorable discourse indeed with Jehovah himself for the preacher and the whole human race and the prince of darkness for the audience. You see, brothers and sisters, today we face an enormous amount of uncertainties that can only get worse because man is sinful. Because our world has been struck by a curse that has separated us from God. But praise God, even, even in the presence of sin, even in corruption, chaos, separation, conflict, battle, and a curse, the promise of God stands victorious and continues to have victory. We know this to be true, right? Here's how we know. You are all here today. You are all here because of the work of this Savior who has been sent to earth to die on the cross to save you and transform you from your sin, bringing you from darkness into light. You are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. To do good works. Don't you see, brothers and sisters, we proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that He has won and He is continuing to win. He is continuing to, to gain ground. Our missionaries are here with us today. And if that's not an example of God gaining ground, brothers and sisters, in various places in the world, 
We must open our eyes to see that our God is still at work in the midst of the mess, in the midst of all the uncertainty, in the midst of rules and regulations, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of political upheaval, in the midst of things going from bad to worse. He is victorious. The battle has been won by Christ, who has come to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. And we have this hope. Romans 16, 20 says that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. So brothers and sisters, this morning, as we draw near to a season where there's so much uncertainty, so much upheaval, we remember that the greatest force in this world, as Warren Wearsby said, the greatest forces in this world are not earthquakes and thunderbolts. The greatest forces in this world are babies. <laughs> and specifically one baby. Babies have the most life-changing impact. They bring something new. They bring something hopeful into a family. But this baby, this baby has brought life and hope and peace and love and joy into this world. And so, even in the presence of a curse, God's promise stands victorious over evil. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that even there, you have come against the serpent's work. And Father, through Jesus Christ, you have divided, you have cut off the old man, the old woman, and put them to death. And you've raised to new life one who, has been, who is now bearing the likeness and image of Christ because of what he has done for us, that we are now no longer united to the serpent or to the works of evil, but now if we are through faith in him, by grace alone, through faith alone, by, by in Christ alone, we are united to Christ. And therefore, if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, the new has come. And so, Lord, may Christmas be a reminder of this hope, of this newness, of this truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.